A state with a history of supporting gun rights is weighing how to respond to a mass shooting in El Paso, Texas, that killed 22 people over the weekend. On Wednesday, Republican Governor Greg Abbott announced upcoming roundtable discussions to hear policy proposals in the wake of the attack. It comes as President Trump visited Texas, where he met with some of the shooting survivors at a local hospital. Patrick Svitek covers politics for the Texas Tribune, and he joins me now. Patrick, thanks very much for being with us. Let's talk about the president's visit to El Paso. How would you characterize how the president was received in Texas today? Well, I think that there, ahead of his visit, there was a lot of um, discomfort and unease with him visiting the city uh, by the elected officials in the city. Obviously, it's an overly democratic city, and it's a city that has felt, uh, you know, among those democratic officials, uh, deeply alienated by his his rhetoric and, and uh, policies on immigration. And so, you even had some some prominent Democrats in the city uh, come out and say, even before his trip was announced, we don't want the president here. He's only going to make things worse. And so, again, you had, I think, some real discomfort and unease, and in some cases, outright opposition to him visiting ahead of this trip. Um, now, it looks like it, it, you know, it turns out that it's a, it's a pretty um, low-key visit by him. I think he's probably only spending a, a few hours on the ground. He went to a hospital, and I believe right now he's uh, meeting with first responders at the Emergency Operations Center. Um, and so far, it you know, has not been that politically charged of a visit. Uh, but nonetheless, you had some, some real prominent Democrats there um, say that they didn't want him to come. Well, Governor Greg Abbott faced backlash in 2018 when he asked the legislature to consider a red flag law after a shooting at Santa Fe High School. Back then, he refused to actually endorse red flag laws. Now the governor says he will host roundtable discussions in the wake of El Paso. Um, what do you expect to happen next? Yeah, it'll be interesting to see those red flag laws have really been the flashpoint in Texas after the Santa Fe massacre. He had asked lawmakers uh, to at least consider red flag laws, but that very quickly uh, you know, fell apart after he felt the internal, uh, you know, uh, opposition from his own party to those kinds of provisions. He's not talking about them immediately in the aftermath of the shooting or not talking about them as a proposal uh, kind of on the table. And so it remains to be seen whether that's something that he asked lawmakers to look at. Again, he sounded a little skeptical of the idea earlier today when asked about red flag laws. He said something along the lines of, well, there weren't many red flags with this particular uh, gunman in, in El Paso. And so it doesn't sound like, at least for now, that that's a path that he's, he's willing to go down. Uh, now, there were, a, a, you know, more than, I think, two dozen proposals that came out of those roundtables uh, after Santa Fe that were ultimately passed into law. Uh, but a lot of them were focused on uh, mental health and uh, proposals that stopped short of any real serious uh, reform to gun laws in Texas. Well, immediately following the El Paso shooting, some leading Republicans in Texas, including Land Commissioner George P. Bush and Senator Ted Cruz, linked the massacre to white terrorism. Why do you think these two put out a different response from Senator John Cornyn or the governor who initially linked that shooting to mental health and video games? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good question. We've definitely seen different responses, at least in the immediate aftermath from some statewide officials. George P. Bush, the land commissioner, was definitely the most uh, proactive in responding by, by uh, talking about and emphasizing the apparent uh, racial motive in this shooting. He called, he called the shooting part of a, a kind of a, a troubling trend of what he called white terrorism. The next morning, he had Ted Cruz come out and say that this is a, a heinous act of terrorism and, and white supremacy. Um, you know, these are these are two uh, Texas Republican leaders who, um, you know, certainly have their critics, um, but have, have talked in the past about uh, needing to speak uh, more effectively and more inclusively to a diversifying Texas. And so it wasn't shocking to hear those two leaders in particular use that kind of language. Um, it's been more interesting to see how, uh, you know, they continue to kind of stand alone in that reaction. Uh, some other statewide officials have certainly not gone that far in terms of uh, acknowledging the, the, the role of race in the shooting. I want to talk about the broader political landscape there in Texas. Recently, four Republican congressmen announced they will not seek re-election. And we spoke to the chairman of the Democratic Party of Texas on Tuesday, Hilberto Hinojosa. He thinks this is a chance for Democrats to turn the state blue. Do you expect Republicans to face an uphill battle holding on to those seats? I, I do. I mean, those uh, there's three seats that have retirements now that were already being targeted by national Democrats. Now that those seats are open, I believe that they become 
even more competitive um, in the case of Will Hurd's seat. Uh, now that he's retiring, um, that to me, that seat goes from being a, a toss-up election to a, a lean Democratic election. But it's now, I would argue, more in favor of Democrats uh, to, to take that seat than for Republicans to hold on to it. And so it, it definitely continues to alter the landscape in Texas in favor of Democrats to have those retirements in those three, again, already nationally targeted seats. Well, keeping with 2020, the Hispanic population of Texas is growing. Latinos are expected to be the largest population group in the state by 2022. A recent Telemundo poll found that a quarter of Texas Latinos support the president's reelection. Are uh, supporters of President Trump, Latinos are otherwise essentially standing by the president no matter what? Yeah, I mean, we've seen this time and time again in, in Texas. And it, I think that the bottom line here is that Latino voters are not a monolithic uh, voting block. There's there, there's a, a little more nuance to folks, um, you know, who are following politics here on the ground sometimes than what the, the national narrative portrays the Latino vote as. Um, and it's not a, a voting block that the Republicans have necessarily uh, conceded in past election cycles here. We've had some top Republicans in the state, like the governor, Greg Abbott, who've made real serious efforts um, to uh, appeal to the Latino community. And so, uh, you know, again, it's just it's not a monolithic voting block. Definitely a, a, a democratic friendly, democratic leaning voting bloc. Um, but it, it is competitive in, in ways that sometimes surprise people. And I think that number you just mentioned speaks to that. All right, Patrick Svitek for us. Patrick, thank you very much for sharing your insights. Thank you for having me.